Hi, I'm Daniel Green. I'm the president here at the Newberry Library. Welcome. It's great to have such a wonderful turnout. Thanks for being patient with us while we just set up a few more chairs. Um, we're so pleased to welcome you here tonight to celebrate the exhibition, June Fujita, American Visionary. This exhibition, as you know, is, is co-presented by the Newberry and the Poetry Foundation. And what you've seen in our galleries this evening is an expanded version of an exhibition first mounted at the Poetry Foundation in 2017. The exhibition explores Fujita's poetry, photojournalism, landscape photography, and his uncommon life. The Newberry is honored to collaborate with the Poetry Foundation and to be part of the evolution of this fascinating exhibition. Some of you may know that the Newberry and poetry have had a long relationship as institutions. Poetry Magazine, in fact, um, for a long time had its offices right here within the library. So this collaboration is a natural because of the shared histories and the overlapping mission of the Newberry and the Poetry Foundation. And it's also a natural because June Fujita's work intersects in so many ways with the Newberry's collection. This collaboration has enabled us to draw upon our extensive holdings in Chicago history and literature to illuminate the time in which June Fujita lived. And we're so honored to have the curators of the exhibition here this evening, as well as June, Fuji June Fujita's great nephew. Uh, before I introduce them, I wanna let you all know that the Newberry has a dynamic slate of public programs occurring in conjunction with this exhibition. Um, you can pick up this sheet on the table um, and um, see some of the offerings we have during the run of this exhibition, which uh, runs through the end of March. And like the exhibition and like this evening, all of the public programs are free and open to all. And we're also offering a series of adult education seminars that are designed to help you engage the exhibition in greater depth um, through a special series of one-day seminars. If you want to pick up this brochure on the table, you can see that there are offerings um, related to June Fujita's childhood. Uh, there's a Tonka poetry workshop. There's seminars on Japanese-American resettlement in Chicago during World War II, the visual culture of Japanese incarceration. There's a seminar on reading documentary photographs. So information on these public programs and seminars are all available on the table there. And of course, they're available on our website um, at newberry.org. Um, you can register online now through our adult education seminars program. I'm so pleased tonight to introduce our speakers, Fred Sasaki, Catherine Litwin, and Graham Lee. Fred Sasaki is the art director at Poetry Magazine and the Poetry Foundation Exhibition's co-curator. He edited Who Reads Poetry, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2017 with Don Scher and June Fujita, Oblivion, uh, published by the Poetry Foundation in 2017 with his co-curator, Catherine, Catherine Litwin. Catherine Litwin is the library director and exhibition's co-curator for the Poetry Foundation and the co-curator of this exhibition with Fred Sasaki. Graham Lee is a writer, graphic designer, and the great nephew of June Fujita. Lee has spent the last five years researching Fujita's life, retracing his great uncle's footsteps, and creating a story that combines a rich family history with historical and personal photographs of extraordinary Chicago events. So please welcome me in joining Fred Sasaki, and please join me in welcoming <laughs> Fred Sasaki, Catherine Litwin, and Graham Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. It's an honor and a privilege to be here tonight to talk about June Fujita. The American Visionary Exhibition was a collaborative effort on every level, and before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the work of this amazing team. From the Newberry, Alice Schreier, Lisa Dowd, Liesl Olson, Amanda Kasich, Paul Gale, M.N. Kennedy, Andrea Villasenor, Alex Teller, Rebecca Haynes, Elizabeth Cummings, Sarah Wilson, Lauren Calcote, Natalia Maliga, Virginia Meredith, Catherine Gass, Matt Clark, Chris Cermak, Pete Dernberger, Mike Mitchell, Jason Ulane, and Allison Hinderleiter. From the Poetry Foundation, Karen Skoulis, Sarah Witcher, Emily Beanick, Liz O'Connell Thompson, and Maggie Queenie. For their installation expertise, Natasha Spencer, Dan Witzak, Stephen Smoker, and Mike Sloan. 
For their assistance throughout this and the previous exhibition, Russell Lewis, Angela Hoover, and John Russick from the Chicago History Museum. For the clarifying vision of their own research on June Fujita, Chikamatsu Chandler, and Takako Day. And of course, the two lovely people on stage with me, my dear colleague, Fred Sasaki, co-curator of this exhibition, and Graham Lee, June Fujita's great nephew, and author of the forthcoming biography, Fujita Behind the Camera, and without whom none of this would be possible. And now, June Fujita. June Fujita was born in 1888 in Onomichi City, Japan. Uh, this is a photograph of June Fujita as a student. It would have been taken around 1900. It's interesting to note that many of the formal props supplied incidentally as background here, such as trees, flowers, the act of writing itself, will later become the focus of June's art. He attended the Mukashima Central Elementary and Middle School, graduating in 1904 at the age of 15. His family was upper class, and he was the middle child in a family of three. Little is known about the reasons for his decision to leave Japan, but in 1906, at 17, he departed for Canada on a photo assignment for a relative, where he worked a myriad of jobs before moving on to Chicago in 1909. One story about his leaving, which is told by Fujita himself in an interview for The Circle, a University of Chicago student magazine, is that it was precipitated by a scandal with June professing his love for an older teacher at his high school and the resulting stigma and shame necessitating his departure. Although the truth of this story is not known, after his departure, June likely never returned, and if at all, only briefly. Here is a photograph of June's high school graduation in Chicago, taken roughly 10 years later. His charisma here is palpable. He's right there in the center of the very first row of students, impossible to miss. Unlike every other student pictured, he sits with his arms and legs crossed. Where many of his peers look awkward and uncomfortable, stiff in their poses, he appears confident and at ease. He regards the camera with a gaze that holds two contradictory impulses, at once warm and yet slightly removed. In another photo taken that same year at Miggs Field, his smile is happy and open. He's enjoying life as a young man of 25. Fujita is about to embark on many different adventures. In short order, he will play a leading role in the movie Otherwise Bill Harrison. He will enroll in college in pursuit of an electrical engineering degree and then decide this path is not for him. And he will join the Chicago Evening Post as a photojournalist, the first Japanese American to achieve that distinction. Shortly after being hired, he'll be one of the first photographers on the scene during the Eastland disaster in 1915. He will go on to cover many other important moments in Chicago history, such as the 1919 race riots, the trial of Leopold and Loeb, and the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Another 10 years after these photographs were taken, he will publish his only book, Tonka, Poems in Exile. His choice of the word exile is an interesting one and one that I would like to consider. As a poet, Fujita was exacting with words. By the time of Tonka's publication, he was 33. He lived in three countries, been a leading actor in films for Charlie Chaplin's SNA Studios, and photographed most of the important people and events taking place in Chicago during the period. He had found love with his lifelong partner, Florence Carr. By any measure, June Fujita's voyage from the land of his birth had led him to a level of, level of success that for most of us proves elusive. And yet this word exile stands in counterpoint to the narrative in which June Fujita moves seamlessly from accomplishment to accomplishment against a glittering backdrop of Chicago. It's there like an undertow or a backbeat. The definition of exile is a period of forced or voluntary absence from one's country or home. How one defines home or the country to which one belongs cannot be quantified by what is written on our passports alone. Exile is indivisible from loss. This photo was taken at Miller Beach in 1922. We don't know who this group of Japanese men are or how June came to be there with them. 
We don't know what contact June had with other Japanese Americans in Chicago, but all evidence is that it was limited. In the aftermath of Pearl Harbor, when pressed to assert that he had had no contact at all, he seems in conflict. The assertion is made, then crossed out, then made again. In 1941, speaking about the experience of being declared an enemy alien by the US government, Fujita would write, it is very difficult to think of myself as an enemy alien. I cannot feel that I am one. The truth that a poem asserts is often contradictory. In a poem, opposing possibilities are able to be equally true. Poetry was always at the center of Fujita's life. Although he never published another collection after Tonka, he continued to devote himself to writing throughout the next 40 years. Some of his unpublished poems written during these years are on view in the exhibition. Later this evening, we'll also read one of his unpublished verse dramas set in Furnaceville, Indiana, just outside of Chesterton. Now I'm going to turn things over to Fred, who will speak more about Fujita's poetry and life. Thank you, Catherine. Um, <clears throat> so, Catherine's overview of the life and times of Jun Fujita indicates multiple ways of looking at our beloved hero as poet, photographer, actor, Japanese, American. He's discovered, forgotten, and now uh, reimagined. Likewise, there's no right way to experience the exhibition itself, faceted with poems photographs and ephemera, which have been diligently cared for by Fujita's archivist champion and great nephew, Graham Lee, whom we will hear from shortly. Lee has put together a record of the old standard American dream, rife with nightmares inherent to such an endeavor. Here is the paper that allowed Fujita passage to a new world. So imagine a boy of 17 sailing the ocean alone from his native Japan to a promised land of wealth and leisure. He writes poetry and takes nature photos, even publishes a book to some acclaim. He stars in a movie. Celebrities know his name and smile his way. Al Capone, even, who has his good side. He meets a girl at a poetry reading. They marry. He races boats, builds a cabin in the woods, and concerns himself with the moods of wildflowers. All the while he is living, all the while he is living with the news, firsthand on the scene, bearing witness to the aftermath of a black boy being stoned to death for crossing imaginary white lines during this nation's red summer, watching black people murdered and families made homeless by white gangs deranged with race hatred. He takes toll of the 844 young workers and children drowned aboard the SS Eastland, feet from shore in a few fathoms of water on the Chicago River. He portrays women pickets imprisoned for demanding just pay, who endured police brutality, exorbitant fines, and harsh sentences with a smile. And personally, he suffers nationalized race discrimination mandated by presidential decree. So here we are witnessing history repeating itself. And yet we know very little about the man whom we have already spoken so much. Traces of his life survive, but in such a way that provokes fascination. And what we know best that survives completely intact and on his own terms are his poems. And it is poetry that remains central and most salient to Jun Fujita's identity and life story. It's helpful to note that the reason we have this show at the Newberry and the one we staged at the Poetry Foundation is thanks to Jun Fujita's poetry returning home to Poetry Magazine one day in the early 2000s. Uh, the renowned photographer Orlando Cabanban, who was a longtime friend to Jun Fujita, took it upon himself to donate an unpublished typescript and two editions of Tanka, all of which are included in the show. We had no idea about any of it and would actually remain in the dark for several years longer before his story developed anew. Poetry was paramount to how 
Fujita defined himself as an artist in allegiance to country during wartime and until his dying day. We mean this exhibition as a way of seeing or experiencing a lens through which we can reckon history. Uh, through one eye, we see Fujita's vision of America, tragic, murderous, obsessed, Chicago building at epic scale, suffering monumental loss and buckled under racism, all the while preoccupied with commerce and celebrity. Through a second eye, we see the vision Jun Fujita put forward of what American can mean, that it can mean being born in Japan, working indelibly for America, while breaking the line between enemy alien and citizen, eventually weaving himself inextricably from the fabric of the United States of America. And it's through a third eye that we see the poet as seer, the visionary who seeks what cannot be said, what cannot be seen, and in this presence, more absence. And so uh, I'm gonna leave you this part with some poems. Uh, and also we're actually going to hope, hope you will take home a poem of Jun Fujita's. We printed these uh, broadsides uh, of a poem that appears in the show as well as a photograph uh, entitled Michigan Boulevard. It's on that table over there with a lot of other great information so you can continue your own research. And the only thing I'll say about Jun Fujita's poetry, um, you're about to hear from Fujita himself. And this is from an essay he published in Poetry Magazine in June 1922 titled, A Japanese Cosmopolite. I pronounced it correctly. Uh, in it, Fujita put forward what is Japanese poetry. He was apt to make these sorts of pronouncements. He says, to feel that strange silence of the mountains and the sky and the roar of the fall is typically Japanese. To feel and create this poetic silence and through it to suggest the roar, the power, and the majesty of the fall without describing it is the mission of Japanese poets. And if such a poem is successfully written, it has infinitely stronger expression, at least to a Japanese than hundreds of adjectives piled upon each other by Western poets. So herewith is a seasonal selection from Tanka following the common trope of nature passing time. Winter. The book was divided um, by season. From the clear depth inlaid with stars an echo of the glittering snow, a fleeting song and bell over the icy horizon have left a vibrant void. Spring. The sloping sand plain fades into pale night air. A black tree skeleton casts no shadow Summer. There is no time here. From giant trunks, hoary moss hangs through the air of shadowy green and cool dew drips. Autumn. A sudden caw lost in the air leaves the hillside to the autumn sun, save a leaf or two curling, not a sound is here. And now uh, we'll welcome to the podium, Liesl Olson, director of Chicago Studies at the Newberry, to read with us from a drama in one act, which is the short verse drama by Fujita that I mentioned earlier. Um, this has never been publicly performed, been publicly performed in, until now. A drama in one act. The stage setting and characters, a frozen pool in the woods, the moon and a fool. 
place on Furnaceville Trail. Fool. The pool is frozen tonight. The pool that nursed a dragon of black and gold is frozen. Yes, in her abysmal bosom, she nursed the dragon. Moon. Silent. Fool. Tell me, Moon, did I not see you conspire a weird plot against the pool? Tell me, did you not charm her to smile to you while you brought about subtle death? I saw you, Moon, I did. Moon. Silent. Fool. Yes, I saw the shadow of dead branches sway over the pool. Moon. Silent. Fool. They don't move now. Moon. Silent. Fool. I saw you coax dying leaves to leave the twigs, one and one, with a cautious and crisp sound they fell. They thought you befriended them. Moon. Silent. Fool. None moves now. Voice in the air. You see a leaf standing upon the frozen crystal. He is dead. He casts a clear shadow. Fool. Yes, yes. You see the trees all in a frost gray standing rigidly against the frost, against the blue black sky. They are brittle. Fool. Yes. Voice in the air. There is a crystalline sharpness in the pool. My work is done. Fool. Yes, moon. Voice in the air. Death is clean. Come to me. Come. Moon. Silent. Curtain. And um, we'll turn things over to Graham now to speak more about June Fujita's amazing life and family. That uh, one-act drama is a little hard to follow. <laughs> Thank you for indulging us. Uh, it was a lot of fun rehearsing at work. <laughs> um, so I'm going to take you through kind of a family slideshow, kind of uh, casually. Um, this is not June Fujita. Uh, this is my grandfather, and it's through him largely um, I use as my touch point into the world of June Fujita. Um, they were best friends. They shared a lot of the same interests in music and art, and um, they tinkered constantly with uh, their stereo sound systems, um, photography, camping, boating, fishing. Um, this was... This was what June Fujita was doing when he was not on the streets of Chicago following the latest news story. Um, the reflection that I see in, in, my, in my grandfather's eyes there when I pictured June on the other side of the boat, that's all I need to know really about their relationship. So I look at that and I just, I see it all. But there was a lot of mystery with what my grandfather left me with. He gave me boxes of things that I really didn't even open until after he died. Um, I wasn't ready for them. But when I did look into them, there was a lot of mystery to it. And things turned up later. This is an example of a photograph that came with that collection from Orlando Caban Band. He split some of it with the Poetry Foundation and he gave the rest to me saying, I've been waiting for a family member of June Fujita to show up. I've got something for you. He had photographs, he had pictures, he had letters, things that I didn't know anything about. Um, and it brought me into this world of research and connections that I didn't even think were possible. Um, connections here on the stage, there's people in the audience. Uh, Professor Chikamatsu uh, is in the audience. Uh, Takako is in the audience, Takako Day opened up worlds into 
uh, Japan that I didn't think were possible. And as a result, it seems fairly obvious, but I, this is June's brother. So Gichi and his, his wife, Ren, and their seven children. And it opened up this whole new doorway to a world that June largely closed when he left Japan. These photos were there as well. This is June's sister, Chio, and his mother, um, which I always, Tatsu. And then the research and the you know, digging kind of into this past of June Fujita led us into other sort of adventures like Come on, did he really star in a one act or in a silent picture that seems fantastical? And yet we've got the proof. Here he is, starring as a manservant, a valet for sort of a dream within a dream movie, otherwise Bill Harrison. They're, um, they're going to infiltrate a drug ring. And then happy accidents along the way. It's 1931 and Capone's in a little trouble tax evasion stuff. Can you see, can anyone spot June in the photo? Yeah. So there, there he is. So not a photo he took, but kind of a rare glimpse of him in action. Um, and you find these, I'm always scanning the photos, looking in crowd scenes at all the uh, events he might have covered. Um, I found him at the Leopold and Loeb trial kind of in the background half faded out you can hardly see him but you recognize him it's june um i think there's a glimpse of him that i see at the eastland disaster from behind but he's got a very unique stance to him you you could pick him out it's him um that's also at the race riots um there's a glimpse of him running with his camera he's it's the same crowd the same picture you've seen with the crowd chasing down the down the uh, stockyards Another photo, another photographer captured June just in the background, all chasing after this story. After, the, after he left the Chicago Evening Post, when it was absorbed by the Daily News, he started his own um, photography company uh, called Photocraft. And he did a lot of, uh, at that time, uh, food photography was in. Um, soldiers returning from the war were all interested in a home-cooked meal. Everyone wanted a picture of the turkey. Um, but he also did old-time radio ads. He, um, uh, here's um, Lights Out, old-time radio show uh, featuring Boris Karloff. Um, the pictures on the right are of June's. So those are all the sound effect people stabbing knives into meat and you know, the shoe steps on the corn and all that kind of cool stuff in those old time radio shows. Other things are a mystery. I don't know what is happening in this photo. <laughs> I love it so much. I love the curve of the tree on the left. I love what he's wearing. I don't know who the woman is. It is not Florence. It is not his wife. I don't know who the boy is. I love the look on his face. Probably the same look that I have when I look at this photo going, I don't know what's going on. But I like to show it because maybe someone here knows. Um, a casual walk on the beach with June uh, was never just that. It was tramping the dunes. You packed up your gear. You were going to cook. You were going to take photos. You usually had backpacks. Um, he supplied sticks for you to walk with. Um, this is my mom on the left. Florence is in the middle. And June in his pith helmet, he's ready for his adventure. He loved the dunes so much. He loved the, um, the drama of the flowers and uh, the ever-changing landscape of the dunes was, was his, was, he was in his environment there. We've all got photos like this in our family albums, right? So again, I don't know the story, but I like to paint the picture of June, who loved to cook, which was unusual. Um, he's got my grandmother in his arms, so my grandfather's wife, uh, Josephine. And it's, it looks like she's holding a knife. I don't know what's going on. But, but they're doing a tango, is, is kind of what I, what I see. And it harks back to a story um, in June's youth. Um, he and my grandfather, Wayne, were introduced by Florence 
and Florence was asking Wayne to introduce June to the city. Go show him things. Take him to jazz clubs. Show him, bring him, bring him around. Um, so Wayne thought it would be a good idea to teach him tango lessons. They ended up with two dates in a boarding house. After it closes, they have to climb up to the roof, jump to the next building to get out as if nothing happened. Here's June on the right in full storytelling mode. It was always, it was always told me that when June was around, you were just sort of in rapt attention to what he was going to say next. He often sat back and watched where his conversations happened, and then people would turn to him and say, June, what do you think? And then he would launch into something like this, and he would tell a story. This is just two years before he passed, um, 1961. He is teaching my mom geometry. So even though he abandoned his electrical engineering and math, it was always there with him. I think it, it helped him with his photography. Um, my mother got into college. Mm -hmm. This picture, I think, is sort of the, the opposite of the first picture. So the first picture, you've got June taking a picture of Grandpa Wayne. This is Grandpa Wayne taking a picture of June. So it's the kind of the opposite reflection. And again, the look in his eyes sort of just tells me again everything I need to know about them. They were inseparable. They were best friends. Um, and I'm just so happy to, to share these stories about June to kind of add just more to the legacy of all the pictures that he, that he took and kind of give you a glimpse of what was behind, what was behind the photographer. And I'll leave you with this one. Probably the last photo of June and Florence, um, content now to sit in the back of the seat rather than racing the boats around like they were so happy doing all through their lives. Um, again, the kind of look in his eyes just, I, I, she's telling him something. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, the story continues um, in the exhibition and in the, the, the coverage that we see. Um, a book I've written contains this and so much more, and uh, we're happy to announce that it's going to be published next year. So uh, the June adventure continues, and I'm so happy that we could be here and share it with all of you today. Now, so And, and we're happy to take um, questions from the audience now. If you'll just raise your hand and I'll bring over the microphone, right? Thank you very much. Very interesting. But I'm not clear on the relationship. He's your great uncle by marriage or? So by marriage. So uh, I like to walk it up. So um, my grandfather's sister is Florence, who married June. Um, so. So technically, I don't know. He's, all, he's always just been Uncle June to me. Not by birth. Yes. What kind of camera did he use, or cameras? Oh my gosh, uh, there's a list of cameras. Um, I wish I could tell you the, the, that first, that box camera. Someone must know what that camera is in the audience. Deerdorf, I've seen that. I've got a list of what he what he had when he passed away, and there's probably eight different cameras on it. The one in the pool. Deerdorf, you say? All right, next question. Uh, this is for the uh, gentleman here with glasses. Um, you asked, or you mentioned, what was going on and with the wheelbarrow. You couldn't tell he was in a dress. Right. Um, my grandfathers used to play pinochle back in their turn of the century, and whoever lost had to wear a dress. <laughs> I like that. Maybe and, that's it. Yeah, they could wear their cigar and their hat, but <laughs> they, they had to wear a dress and, and drive the car around. And so he had to put as a, as a, as losing the game, he had lost, to push the woman around in the cart, wear was the dress. Probably a lost bet. <laughs> I like lost that. Bet. I like that. <laughs> I'm just curious because obviously um, the relationship was biracial. 
which uh, in, the, in that era was probably a bit unusual. Do you feel comfortable maybe sharing a little bit about anything you know about uh, what they may have encountered from you know, the society at the time or how that may have impacted uh, the relationship or anything about his life? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And uh, bless you. I, I, I feel like the, um, the confidence that both of them had combined with where they lived in an artistic you know, community, I think insulated them from that sort of um, uh, racial attack. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't think that we, there's. We never. We've never really talked about it. The thing that that does come to mind is that they were they were so concerned about how their child might be uh, perceived, is that they chose not to have have children at all. Um, uh, Florence went so far as to ensuring that they wouldn't. Um, so sort of heartbreaking in that sense. But on the flip side of that, meeting Florence's family. And the two kids, my mom and my uncle, um, really became their kind of adoptive children. So they were there. They were they were surrounded by kids constantly. They were being visited by by my mom and uncle uh, frequently. So that was that was lovely. And uh, on February thirteenth, there will be a program that examines this uh, that the love and life of Jun Fujita, and we'll be talking about their courtship, but then also uh, anti miscegenation laws and what the climate was in Chicago, but then also nationwide, uh, looking up at in-marrying and out-marrying statistics. So I'll give you a picture of what the environment was like. We have a question back here. So his brother in Japan, was that his older brother and he was the younger brother? And was that one of the reasons why he left Japan, because he was the younger brother? Well, that's not really known. I mean, um, his brother also left Japan at that time, um, but they didn't go to the same place. Um, you know, the story that I told about uh, the love letter that he had given to a teacher is a story that Jun Fujita himself propagated, but it, it's not known how much, whether that is, um, as they say about jokes, like in all jokes, there's a grain of truth. Well, I think in all stories, there's a grain of truth, but where that grain is, we don't know necessarily. But I think um, there are other uh, possibilities, like there was smallpox at that time, um, mm -hmm. So it could have been that they both left to avoid sickness. And you can. Yeah. And, 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 and maybe just uh, job related, too, I think was the other kind of um, proposed deal. So he had an opportunity to um, work at, for an uncle who had a magazine to go take photos um, of the lumber and salmon industry in, in Canada. And he, he just never came back. Mm. Question here. And then I'll come back. Do we know more about Florence? Did she have a career? Um, Florence was uh, a social service worker. She also wrote um, entries for the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. So did some journalism. Yeah, when he came here in 1909, uh, did he have family in this area? June? June. None whatsoever. Um, all okay. his, all his um, uh, direct descendants are in Japan. Um, and to the best of our knowledge, he never returned. There are some letters uh, from his sister to him, um, which have been translated, uh, kind of heartbreaking. I know you're over there. Um, we miss you. Um, really lovely kind of letters, uh, very poetic. Um, Were there other Japanese coming to uh, the United States at that time? And for what reason? There were not a large, there was a small community in Chicago as compared to other areas of the US like California and the West Coast. So there were other Japanese people in Chicago, but the community was very small, although it grew significantly um, over time. Hi, my name is Lowell Thompson. I wrote this book, African Americans in Chicago, Pictorial History, part of the Arcadia Publishing's Images of America series. I stumbled across uh, June Fujita uh, a couple of years ago uh, at the Poetry Foundation. I went to see something else and I saw the photographs and I met Fred. And the thing that amazed me was that here this guy who was a Japanese American, uh, could get access to places that no uh, 
African American could get access to, uh, especially the scenes of uh, the race riot of 1919, where he took pictures that I had seen for years, for decades, of, of white Chicagoans stoning, actually killing an African American and killing and burning. And he had access somehow. So I wondered, I said, what relationship did he have with African Americans in Chicago? Is there any information about any relationship he had with African Americans? Uh, that's a, a great question and great observation, too, about June's role um, at the riots. Um, there is not any uh, evidence uh, of any relationships with any African Americans or Japanese, for that matter. They really kept to themselves um, and yet had this fear of friends uh, kind of around the artistic and writing community. Um, I know it was a topic of conversation in some letters. Uh, it's always, uh, you know, race riots was definitely a topic for conversation. They had um, dinners and gatherings where people would come and talk. Uh, they had friends like Hemingway and Faulkner who would come into town and be like, well, let's go over to the Fajitas and let's have a chat mm -hmm. and see what's going on in Chicago, what's happening. And that's amazing. Um, so I, I don't know. Uh, I recall going to the presentation at the um, Poetry Foundation a few years ago, and one of the photographs um, sparked my curiosity about the level of threat that he felt as he was, as one of the photographs showed him in a campsite, if I recall correctly, with a revolver sitting on a stump because he was under a fair amount of threat. And who was he being threatened by? Was it the FBI or was it individuals or, or what have you? If you could speak to that. You're referring to the photo of him at his writing desk in the woods? Yeah. 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 Okay, so for those of you who haven't seen the photo, uh, it's in the exhibition, and I really encourage you to look closely at it. So and so he would be in the woods, and he would make what he needed, um, like this writing desk made from, like, wood, wood in the forest. And you see there, uh, tucked to the side with the typewriter on top, uh, the pistol just sort of at hand, um, although... I imagine that was just more his character or personality. Yeah. I, I think so. And I, I like to see the, the typewriter as the main weapon and then the, mm. the gun kind of <laughs> just there for yeah. show. Well, do you, would, you, would you like to tell the, the legend of Al Capone's uh, recruitment? Right. Um, June was kind of famously known for being adept with throwing knives. He. He, he in the, at the Indiana Dunes, he was uh, he killed a ra uh, what a Masasuga rattlesnake by pinning it against a tree. Word spread, and then a black car pulls alongside Michigan Avenue. The, the back the window rolls down. Al Capone is in the back seat and says, "Hey, Fujita, I hear you're good with the knife. We could use someone with your skills." <laughs> June says, I'm better with a camera. Car, the car rolls on. He, call, he calls Florence. She said, I think I was just, you know, invited to the Capone mob. <laughs> um, I don't know. I believe it. But it is true that he was followed by the FBI and that um, his movements were documented and he was seen as a possible threat because he was Japanese and holding the positions that he held. Um, I think you know, the time that he lived in also maybe, and also the spaces that he moved in would have been such that carrying a weapon would, for self-defense would not be unusual, but regardless of that, but yes, I mean, definitely he was targeted in that way too. Yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to know how, how did he fare during World War II? Was he restricted at all or interned? That's a great question. There was a, a moment in time where, uh, was it, right after Pearl Harbor, where his assets were frozen. Uh, he was barred from going into his photo studio. Things were kind of locked down, down for him. And it was due in large part to 
um, his relationship with his former editor um, at the Chicago Evening Post, who at that time had been promoted into the uh, Department of Interior, Reclamation Department, um, to vouch for him, saying, you know, and June had volunteered for World War I, he volunteered, World War II, he volunteered, um, each time declined. Um, and I lost the original question. But yeah, he uh, there was this moment of, you know, kind of heart stopping, a lot of communication between him and the, uh, the, uh, the government saying, he's okay, he's gonna be okay. These are where some of these letters talking about, I can't believe I'm, I'm uh, labeled uh, enemy alien um, are referenced. Um, but then kind of released and kind of free to go. He's registered, so he's got to, you know, he has to fill out forms to go down to Indiana, to the Indiana Dunes. You know, things are restricted, but largely safe. Yeah. Um, so ja Japanese Americans in Chicago at that time were not incarcerated, but prominent people like Fujita had their assets frozen and were targeted. And it's in this uh, letter, this um, statement of allegiance to America that Catherine refers to, where he writes, and I, I remember the day we first saw that, looking over the letters, he writes, I have never associated with Japanese people. But then in the draft, he, he crosses that out and um, you see the conflict there. And one of the things I also love about this, this allegiance letter is that he references his publishing poems and poetry magazine and that he sported uh, this Chicago Symphony. Yeah. Um, and that's right around the time that he marries Florence too, which you can't help but kind of associate that further cementing his American Yes. And, and one last detail about this period that I, is for me very resonant is that um, when this person advocates on his behalf, Michael Strauss, he also repeats this and says, you know, he has never associated with other Japanese since he's been here. So, you know, even his friends are, are obliged to repeat this for him. Uh, um, over here in the, in the back. The peanut gallery. <laughs> um, I was, uh, you know, you talk a little bit about his uh, outdoor life, and I, you know, we talk a lot about the uh, about the uh, Indiana Dunes. And uh, did he camp anywhere else? Uh, was he an outdoorsman at other places? I work for the National Park Service, so I'm just sort of interested in that. <laughs> um, definitely northern Wisconsin, around the Manitowish Waters areas, was a popular destination. And in fact, that's probably where the typewriter gun picture is from. Um, and uh, he had a cabin in um, the, the Boundary Waters, so uh, Rainy Lake uh, Voyagers National Park now. Uh, he was also instrumental in providing pictures for the preservation of the Boundary Waters, so uh, Ernest Oberholzer at the time was uh, trying to stop them from flooding the entire um, islands out. Um, so yeah, he loved camping, but kind of in the northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Indiana Dunes. Back here. Hey, just re reflecting on his question, I photographed the cabin up in ah. Rainy, up on Rainy Lake, and um, amazing experience. It's so rugged up there, but it's 15 miles from town. You can only get there by boat. Do you have any backstory as to why he chose that spot? Like how he built the cabin, any any of that little those little details, you know. Um, cause it, it's pretty amazing up there. It's, it's gotta be in part because that's where the train went. So he, he and it's probably cheap land. Um, I know that we've seen, uh, photographs of, uh, land being offered in that area. Um, like at the States during the state fair. So it was probably a destination of like intrigue, come get an Island. Um, uh, he did design and build the island himself. It was sort of a retreat for uh, himself. Florence never went up there with him. Um, uh, if he didn't take the train, my grandfather Wayne would drive him. Um, it also became kind of a destination for photo shoots uh, for, for uh, businesses like um, uh, Johnson Motors. So they would stage a lot of, they would invite clients up there and stage uh, photo shoots around the islands. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you for all for um, coming here and sharing this amazing story. Um, we definitely appreciate that. 
Um, I would also like to say um, the photos that you've shared with us, um, as far um, the quality for the time was is really crisp and beautiful. And the question I have is, is that um, by you being a family member or anyone in your family, you guys actually have any of the original equipment that was used to take these photos? Mm -hmm. I wish. There, yeah. there was a time when I had an opportunity for a camera and it slipped by and I think of it all the time. Um, there, we, there we go. Um, I, Florence liquidated everything after June died. Um, and that must have been just her decision on what to do. I know some equipment went to my grandfather, so like there was an enlarger that he used for a long time. Um, smaller pieces of equipment, but none of the cameras, you know, oh, those cameras today, I'd love to see one. Yeah. Very happy to be here. I'm very happy, I'm very happy for you being here. Two quick questions. What high school did he go to? Uh, it was Wendell Phillips, and when he graduated, he was 25. And the address of 1150 North LaSalle. Is that where he lived? Correct. So um, in the, I think it was in the 40s onward, it was at the LaSalle Street um, uh, three-story structure. It's still there today. Um, studio on the first floor. Um, it was on the second floor. Storage, I think. And then the, uh, the top floor was the um, his, their apartment. Hi, thanks. Um, just a quick question. I assume it's atypical to have Asian Americans in silent films. So if you have any um, idea of how he had access or got that opportunity and what was the name of it? And also, is that in the exhibit in the Newberry? Thanks. Uh, go for it. Um, well, um, the, he was in a couple of films for SNA, but the one in which he played a leading role was uh, otherwise Bill Harrison. Um, that was a film made for SNA, which was a film studio in Chicago's uptown neighborhood. Um, most of SNA's film stock does not survive, and um, there are some films which do, but this is not one of those films, so the film does not exist any longer. But there are um, images of like reviews of the film, so you, you can get a plot outline of it and. Um, advertisements of the period so we know that this exists it's I mean it is it's highly unusual for someone to play a leading role like that um, in terms of how he ended up in that place in that position we don't know but he does seem like someone who um, I mean he his role as a photojournalist was also very unusual so I mean he doesn't seem to have been overly daunted by by those barriers himself and doesn't it kind of feel like the American dream? You know, someone who's like, I know, I'll go to Chicago and I'll be an actor. So I, I can see him, you know, that's, I'm doing it. Um, did his family support him financially so he could do things like uh, pursue the arts? Um, he traveled from Japan carrying uh, Netsuku. Is that how it's pronounced? Um, little figurines um, that are uh, made of precious stones. Um, and he would use those from time to time to fund bigger things. So uh, down payment on a house, he would cash some of those in and um, kind of make his way. Although it's also true that he also claimed to have come to Chicago because he had heard it was the cheapest place in America to live. <laughs> No one is <laughs> saying. Yeah, the, the, in an article that in um, the Circle, it's reported having believed that uh, where people worked one hour a day and played and studied uh, the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> we have about a minute left. Are there any um, final comments, um, Graham, um, or you know, Fred or Catherine that you would like to make? Yeah. You guys have covered oh, a lot so of ground. <laughs> <laughs> Questions you'd like well, to pose to I'm us? I'm just so happy and to see you all here and grateful uh, for the show and for your interest and uh, from my beautiful colleagues. Um, that's it. Um,
Thank you all for being here. Thank you.